Waiting for the bells to finish ringing. I used to do that. They would lift me off the ground, the bell rope. It was kind of when I was a kid. It was great. My dad would let me do it. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all this morning. I'm Pastor Eric, one of the pastors over at Our Savior, but helping out in the vacancy preaching this morning. So it's great to be with you once again here at St. John. Obviously with me is Pastor Joe again this morning as well. If you're a visitor with us this morning, a special word of welcome to you. Thank you for spending your morning with us as we come together. Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit draws us to this place to receive his good gifts for us, his word and the sacrament this morning. If... Um, No, I already said that part. We're continuing with Romans. We've been doing uh, the book of Romans all summer long and looking at different sections of the book of Romans. We're looking at chapter 6 and a little bit of 7 today. And I just wanted to take a moment because I didn't get a chance last night just to to give some accolades to Mr. Whitney over here because, I mean, I've been in a lot of church services in my life. You You know, what a shock, right? But the music was so perfect to the message, the theme of the message last night. I was just blown away by it. So thank you very much for last night's music and this morning's music as well. I heard you guys practicing as well this morning. So I am, I am really just kind of really impressed by that this morning. But we are, like I said, talk, uh, working our way through the book of Romans. And so I'm looking forward to continuing that with you all today. I'm going to invite you to stand as we begin. And as you turn to one another, I encourage you to bre- greet each other with the sharing of the peace. Thank you. 
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. And salvation you see. We come before the Lord this day to be strengthened in faith and to be witnesses of righteousness and truth before a hostile world. Let us first confess our own sinfulness that we receive mercy, grace, and forgiveness from God. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us, confess, let us pray together the collect of the day. O oh God, your abiding presence always goes with us. Keep us aware of your daily mercies, that we may live secure and content in your eternal love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the readings. Our Old Testament reading that greets us this seventh week in the Pentecost is from Ezekiel, the second chapter. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me and he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send to you them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, and whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that our prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is selected verses from chapter 6 and 7 of the book of Romans. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, were, you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would have not known what it is to covet, if the law has said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced me in all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. 
So the law is holy and the, whole, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him, and Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, they will not listen to you. When you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise the congregation may be seated for our children's message. Come on down. All right, I need everybody to sit down on the floor so you can see the screens. This is really important. A couple more stragglers. They're coming. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Today is an exciting day because we are here for a brand new, never before seen or played game show. It is called, What Does It Become? You are going to see something on the screen. We need to, first of all, identify what it is, and then we identify what it becomes. Let's start. Picture number one, please. Ah, can, does anybody know what this is? Ella, what is it? A caterpillar. Do we ha have any entomologists here? What kind of caterpillar do you... Yes, Aria. It is a monarch caterpillar. What does a caterpillar become? Ooh, what does it become, McKenna? Okay, that's step three. What's step two? Step two, Kaiser, do you know? Close, close, Eliza. It turns into a chrysalis. Yes. Does anybody have any? I haven't seen any of these out yet, but I'm really excited. And then this chrysalis turns into a butterfly, a monarch butterfly. Wow, how beautiful is that? All right, good job, everyone. You each get one million points. Next image. Oh, here we go. Interesting. What, what is on the screen? What is this? Taylor, do you know what it is? There's, there's an egg. What else do we see, Kaiser? Some cooking stuff that you have to cook. That's right. Let's see. Eggs, sugar, butter, uh, flour, Salt, baking soda, baking powder, vanilla, and chunks of chocolate. What could that possibly become? What do you think, Jackson? Cookies. 
cookies. Is it cookies? It is cookies. Raise your hand if you like chocolate chip cookies. Me too. Great job. All right, that's, that's worth at least three million points. Guys, we're doing great today. All right, last question. Ooh, here's something. Here's something. Aria, help me out. What, is, what do you think that is? It's a slave, someone who is uh, burdened by having the chains around their arms, around their wrists. Here is something that we just heard Pastor Joe read. Each of us is a slave to something, and that something is sin. Because of our sinfulness, we, we repent. That's a big word for we try to, try to not sin, but unfortunately, because we're humans and we're not perfect, we keep on sinning. But someone who is a slave to sin does become something else. And that is, Sheridan, someone that is free. And there's a reason why that slave has become free, and it is on that picture. Hazel, what's up there? Because of Jesus, because of what Jesus did on the cross, he has freed us from our sin. He has uh, won the forgiveness of our sins so that we don't have to suffer the consequences, but that we can live with him forever. And so it's all fun to think that a monarch butterfly be or a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, but we need to remember that each of us becomes free through Jesus. Will you pray with me? Fold your hands, bow your heads, close your eyes, and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, we know that we are stuck with our sin. Thank you for dying for us and rising again to free us from sin so that we may be with you forever. Amen. All right. Thank you guys for coming down for this game show. You all win, and now you may go back to your seats. As our children and their parents return to their seats, I invite the congregation to please rise. And once everybody gets settled, we will confess our common faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We'll give them just another minute or two to get settled. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the message. Good morning once again. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you just want to turn this one off? The lectern mic? Or are we picking it up over there? I feel like I'm going to deafen somebody if I'm not careful. Testing. There we go. Okay. We'll start again. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Whitney. Uh, bef um, before we get into the message this day, I want to read a familiar passage to many, if not most of you, I'll admit it is not in the Bible, 
but it is something that should be familiar. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. That is, of course, the preamble to the Declaration of Independence that was adopted 248 years ago this past Thursday on Independence Day. Of course, it was adopted by the Continental Congress, written by written by Thomas Jefferson with notable contributions from other founding fathers like John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. And it was adopted in the middle of the Revolutionary War, establishing the United States of America as a free nation separate from Great Britain. But this section, the preamble, talks about why they felt it necessary to do this. And actually the last couple words I read there were the, the important part, that they, they were worried about their safety and happiness that they no longer felt happy, they no longer felt safe under British rule. I'm going to come down here because I'm still picking up some feedback. But they, never felt, they, still, they didn't feel safe under British rule any longer. And after, in the, after this section, the rest of the declaration is the formal list of charges against the, the British government as to why they felt change was necessary, where they could create a new nation where they could seek safety and happiness. And I'm going to keep coming back to that phrase, safety and happiness throughout this sermon. So I want to invite you to hold on to that because I think it fits nicely into what we're doing today in Romans chapter 6 as we continue our study passing our way through the book of Romans this summer and uh, Pastor Joe obviously just read uh, selected portions of chapters 6 and 7 for us. I'm just going to preach on chapter 6 today what we heard and invite you to stay after this service for the adult Bible study over in the parish hall. Thank you. Um, and we'll look at chapter 7 over there after this. But in chapter 6, I think we do see similar themes as to what's being expressed in the preamble that I just read. I mean, different wording, obviously. I mean, verse 14, St. Paul says, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under, under law, but under grace. You will no longer be ruled by this, Paul says. We're going to be ruled by this now. And what is going to rule over us really is at the heart of the matter here in Romans 6 and also for the life of the Christian, for the Declaration of Independence. What's going to rule over us? Because the, the Founding Fathers didn't seek to live as wild men establishing... I mean, they, they, they sought to establish a new government. For Paul, it's not about law, it's going to be about grace. At no point in God's creation is lawless anarchy an option for us. Something is going to rule over us. Paul continues this thought by presenting his uh, two options for us. This is verse 16, which I brought with me today. St. Paul says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? Law or grace, Paul says. Sin or righteousness. But the question is not who's going to be our master. Paul's not giving us an option today. Rather, he's asking us a different thought. See, this is not some sort of excursus, some separate thought for Paul. This, is, this argument in chapter 6, this question in chapter 6, is building upon everything he's done to this point over the last five weeks, where we've looked at how we are saved in Jesus Christ, right? That despite sin, God sent his son Jesus down to be sin for us, to shed his blood on the cross for us. We have been bought at a price, a blood-bought price, Jesus is now our master. Or another way we could describe it, kind of using the language of the nation, is that we no longer belong to a nation of sin, a nation of rebels, as Ezekiel talks about this morning in our Old Testament reading. No, Jesus has invaded that nation of sin. He's stormed into it and rescued us from it to bring us out of it and bring us into his, his nation of righteousness. Whereas again, Paul says, and this is in verse 17, you were once slaves of sin, but now become obedient from the heart. We don't live in that nation anymore, Paul says. We live in Jesus' nation now. 
And so Paul's not asking the question of who's going to be our master. No, the question is why do, you, why do we still act like we belong to that nation, that old nation of sin? Why do, since we belong to Jesus, why do we keep acting like we belong over there? Now Paul obviously doesn't use a nationality metaphor in what I just read for you there from verse 16 because in his day nationality was kind of not something to be proud of. There was no patriotic pride in his day in the first century. The entire known world is ruled by the Roman Empire. So there's not a whole lot of need, and they're, you know, by force, really. There's not a whole lot of need for patriotic pride. So he uses a different metaphor. He uses slavery. There were slaves to sin, and that's certainly a loaded term in that culture and our culture, too, the idea of slavery. And it's important to recognize whenever you read the New Testament, if you see the word slave, slave and you see the word servant, they are absolutely interchangeable words. The original Greek is identical for both words, slave and servant. They're identical terms in Scripture. So whether we're slaves of sin or servants of sin, it's a, it's a challenging word. But one thing I can tell you, which I think helps answer the question, is that slaves and servants are dependent on their master for everything. That whatever safety and happiness a slave or a servant enjoys in this life, it is, on, is being given to them by their master. Because of that, and because of the Declaration of Independence Act and the holiday we just had, I was also thinking about Martin Luther, who has something to say about this. Something about our safety and happiness. 250 years before Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, Martin Luther wrote his large catechism which is a compendium that helps teach the small catechism, which so many of us have learned in our confirmation. And Martin Luther says this in the large catechism. He says, a God, notice the lowercase g, a God is the term for that to which we are to look for all good, in which we are to find refuge in all need. Therefore, to have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe in that one thing with your whole heart. Whatever we look for for our safety and our happiness, Luther says, will become our, lowercase g, God. And we know the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, right? So when we seek our safety and happiness in created things, rather than, of course, our creator, we're violating the first commandment. We're creating false idols, false gods, breaking the commandment. And to do so makes us slaves of sin, Paul would say. But why? Why are slaves, why would we be slaves, why would we not just be visitors to the nation of sin? Why would we be such an inflammatory word like slaves to sin? Why couldn't we just visit sin, find some happiness, and come back over here? Well, because for one, and I think this answers the question, all gods, lowercase g, no matter the form, all gods will eventually require a sacrifice of us. I mean, think about it. In Paul's day, Paul's day, there's still pagan gods to, in the Roman world, to pagan temples to the Roman pantheon. You know, Zeus and Aphrodite and all those guys. Or it would be Jupiter in Roman, anyway. But if you wanted those gods' favor, you would go to the temple and you would devote yourself to that god, showing your loyalty and your devotion through personal sacrifice to that god in hopes in hopes that that God would give you some safety and happiness. Now, we don't live in that world anymore. We don't have pagan temples all around us anymore. But the, the false gods of this world, of this age, have a way of demanding a sacrifice of us, too. So, a couple months ago, the end of May, uh, right after I actually preached here the first time, I went on vacation with my family back to see family, my family, my in-laws, back in Illinois, back in May. And there's a lot of differences nowadays between Illinois and Nebraska. One is that recreational marijuana use in Illinois is perfectly legal now. But while I was back there, I sought out one of my oldest friends. He's been my friend for 35, 40 years. We talk on the phone frequently, but we never really see each other anymore. So I called him up. Hey, I'm in town. Let's get together. And we were talking about plans. And the thing about my friend... And I'm not going to say his name. But the thing about my friend is that he has struggled with ADHD, adult attention deficit disorder, and severe anxiety all the years I've known him. I mean, he has struggled with this mightily. But since marijuana became legal recreationally in Illinois, he began smoking it. And he found some relief from his anxiety. He found safety and happiness in smoking. 
So we're talking about the plans, and we're not getting anywhere. So he finally just says, Eric, why don't you just come over to my house, and we'll get high together. Now, it's le- remember, it's legal, perfectly legal in Illinois. It's not legal in Nebraska, obviously. And I'm not sure how you all would react, or the members of our Savior Lutheran Church would react, or how President Snow would react to hear that a serving pastor in Nebraska was getting high on vacation, whether it's legal or not. So I told my friend in the strongest terms, no, I will not get high with you, just in case you're wondering. But we continued to talk. And he said, hey, I'm not going to do that with you, but why don't we get together, you know, when you get up tomorrow, give me a call, we'll get together, we'll have lunch, we'll have dinner, we'll spend some time together and see each other. He says, okay, I'll call you tomorrow. He never did. I never heard from him the next day. Because I know what he was doing. He was getting high. It had become his false god. He had found safety and happiness there, and since it was his god, it was going to demand a sacrifice of him. If you want to serve me, it was telling him, you're going to sacrifice something Guess what it sacrificed? Guess what he sacrificed? Me. He chose to sacrifice his time with me to serve his false god. All gods demand sacrifice. And not even the ones, not even just the ones whose legality is debated in this country. No, good things, good things that God gives us can become our false gods. Our work, our families, our health, our self-image, all of these things can become false to us, false idols. I mean, if getting a promotion or recognition at work becomes our our source of safety and happiness, well, it means I might need to work some extra nights and weekends, and I'm going to have to sacrifice time with my spouse, time with my children. Or out here in the Corn Belt, I know farms are a big deal, and maybe a smooth, successful, large, functioning farm becomes our source of safety and happiness. Well, there's always chores to be done, right? Even on Sunday morning, there's plenty of chores to be done on the farm. So maybe to serve my, unfortunately, false God of safety and happiness means sacrificing my church community, my time with my faith, or even our nation. I mean, we're blessed to live in the land of the free. It allows us to gather and speak and worship as we see fit. But if it becomes our source of safety and happiness... It becomes our false god, and it'll demand a sacrifice of us. And what might that sacrifice be? Well, maybe how we treat those who vote differently than us. We have a different version of the United States than us. And we decide we're going to sacrifice civility towards other human beings, people created by God and saved in Jesus Christ. All gods will demand a sacrifice, right? Anything. God has clearly, freely, and just blessedly given to us can become false, can become our false source of safety and happiness if we're not careful. But all gods require sacrifice, even the God of heaven. He has demanded a sacrifice from us. Because of our rebellion, our nation of rebellion, again, Ezekiel says, we We owe God a sacrifice of our own blood. We have rebelled against him. But the God of Christianity is different. Because while we owe a a sacrifice, that God has provided one for us. Right? He has given us the sacrifice. It's Jesus Christ who died that we would live. For all the times we turned our back and sought our safety and happiness in created things over in a nation of sin... Rather than looking to our creator for our safety and our happiness, Jesus came down and died. That we would be restored, rescued from the nation of sin and dropped down into a nation of righteousness. Here we find true safety. True safety in the arms of a God who would do the incredible and send his son down to die in our place. Here we find happiness. True happiness with the promise that this life does not win. The the struggles that every one of us faces, the temptations every one of us feels to go over there and serve sin again does not win. Our happiness is found in the fact that Christ hasn't promised us an eternity with him. He is the king, as we sang in the beginning. He is our true master. He is our sacrifice. He's our Lord. Founding fathers wrote, Again, back from the Declaration of Independence, our Creator has endowed us with, all, with certain unalienable rights. 
Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? We're going to pursue those things in this life. We're, just, we're going to serve something. Something's going to be our master, but true life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is found only in the cross of Jesus Christ. He has won life for us in his name. He has liberated us from the guilt of our sin. And he has given us the promise of a happy eternity with him for all time in his nation of righteousness. Amen? Amen. May the peace of God transcend your hearts and minds. Keep yourselves in Christ Jesus until the day he returns. Amen. I invite you to bow your heads and pray with me, please. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we again celebrate our nation's birth, we say thank you for placing us in this nation where we are able to worship, we are able to speak, we are able to gather in this place to receive your good gifts. Lord God, we are blessed to be a part of this nation, but help us, Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit to be on guard because true safety and happiness can only be found in you. Help us by your Spirit to notice when we are being pulled astray, that while we belong to a nation of righteousness found in your Son, Jesus, the temptation, the lure to go back to the nation of sin remains. Help us to see the, oppor- the moments when we are, we are going astray. Help us to embrace the gospel message that your Son has already won us back under the work of his cross. Lord God, we lift this up in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. We continue our service now with our sermon song.
time, I invite forward all those who have been elected to hold an office within St. John Ministries and ask you to come up front for installation. more coming. I think one more from the back, maybe. Two from the back. Three from the back. Just gather around here. Squeeze in if you can a little bit, folks. Beloved in the Lord, Scripture admonishes us that all things should be done decently and in order. To that end, the Constitution and bylaws of this congregation establish various offices to which men and women are elected and appointed to serve. And so doing the church follows the example of the early Christian church as described in Acts chapter 6. The twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The Apostle Peter writes in his first epistle, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Starting with Jeremy, I'm going to ask you to state your name and the office to which you have been appointed. Speak nice and loud so that they can hear you. Uh, Jeremy Grant, trustees. Laura Loftus, State Fair Board. Stephanie Colbaum, Parish Ed. Caleb Doner, Trustees. Uh, Vincent Haney, Stewardship. Eric Haney, Brookfield. Nikki Holden, Head of Care Board. Randy Hallister, Elder. Deborah Sutherland, Charles Gilmore. Betty Sutherland, Bruce Grant, Stewardship. Christy Schmidt, Parish Ed. Jerry Lynn, Stewardship. Mary Lassie, Head of Care Jeff Wilkins, Vice Chair. You have been chosen to fill specific offices and positions of responsibility at St. John Lutheran Church, Battle Creek. You are to work with the pastors that our life together in Christ may be orderly and pleasing in his sight. You are to see that the services of God's house are held at the proper times, that the word of God is purely preached and taught according to the Lutheran confessions, that the sacraments of Christ are administered according to his institution, that provision is made for the Christian instruction of young and old, that the erring are admonished, and that the discipline is maintained. You are to see that the temple affairs of the congregation are properly administered, and that proper support is provided for the workers of this congregation. You are to assist in caring for the poor and the sick, in cultivating harmony among the members, in promoting the general welfare of the congregation, and in furthering the kingdom of Christ here and throughout the world. While holiness and of life and obedience to Christ are expected of all members of the congregation, it is especially important that you as office bearers in his church show yourselves by word and example to be faithful to him in service and Christian devotion. In the presence of God and of this congregation, I therefore ask you, do you accept the offices entrusted to you and do you promise faithfully to carry out your duties, trusting in the Lord and conforming yourself to his word in accordance with the face of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod? And if so, then answer, I do. I do. Beloved in the Lord, you have heard the promises of faithfulness spoken by these men and these women in whom you have selected to serve as officers of St. John Ministries. Do you promise to support them in their work to remember them your prayers and to work with them to the best of the abilities that God has given you. 
so that he may be glorified and his work may be done in our midst. If so, then answer, we do. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I install you as officers of St. John Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty and most merciful God, enlighten and strengthen you in your offices that you may be good and faithful stewards to the glory of his name and the good of his people. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have raised up these servants for work among your people. We humbly implore you to grant them by your Holy Spirit those gifts needed for the faithful carrying out of their task. Most especially wisdom, strength, and willing hearts. Let your blessing rest on this congregation, strengthen the faith, quicken the love, and enkindle the zeal of its members that your name may be glorified and that here and in all places under heaven the kingdom of your Son may be advanced. We remember with thanksgiving those who have faithfully served your people and have now completed their time of service. We pray that in the end of days we with all your faithful people may hear the voice of Christ saying, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, your labor, is not in vain. The Almighty and most merciful God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Thank you for your service. You may return to your seats. And as they return to their seats, I invite the congregation to please rise for the prayers of the church. We will pray for families celebrating running anniversaries, for our neighbors who are, have experienced uh, flooding and other disasters with all the local rains, and for the ministry that happens here. These petition will end. Lord, in your mercy and the congregation respond to our prayer. Let us go before the Lord. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We bless you, Lord, for you have heard the voice of our pleas for mercy and sent your Son, Jesus Christ, our strength and shield. Save your people and bless your heritage forever. Reminding us of the eternal nature of your blessings, Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, you have revealed your righteousness in the sight of the nations. Christ Jesus, your holy arm, by his death and resurrection, you have worked salvation, strengthened the song of your church, give skill to the musicians, poets, and artists, give boldness to your congregation in this and every place to sing the eternally new song of Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, we ask for your blessings on all holy marriages, especially this week. We pray for Colby and Stacy Calm, Derek and Jenny Zoner, Nathan and Erica Geyer, Richard and Jane Belts, Dan and Deb Schott, and Travis and Morgan Patefield. Lord, in your mercy. We also pray for Willie Cash Erickson, who will enter into the kingdom of God through his baptism later this afternoon. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, soften the hearts of your people in every home. Turn parents and children toward each other in love and patience. Banish the spirit of impudence and stubbornness and rebellion from all. Sanctify us in your truth. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we seek your divine protection and guidance for our nation. Protect and defend us from our enemies. Support our leaders and preserve them from temptation. Enable us to live as quiet and peaceable life according to your word through the work of all civil authorities. And Lord, we pray for our neighbors who have experienced disasters from floods and tornadoes and hurricanes. We ask that you would protect them. Lord, in your mercy. Father, in our weakness, we are strong for the sake of Christ, whose grace is sufficient for every need. Give comfort to those whose pain is chronic, whose suffering is unknown who wrestle with difficult thorns in body or mind, or who are tempted to despair. Especially we pray for Lauren Branstetter, Carolyn Priner, 
Olivia Anderson, Xander Watson, LaDonna Rowert, Karen Ruderbush, Arvid and Jane Warnke, and those we name in our hearts. In weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, let us boast in Christ and his cross, by which we and our sufferings are sanctified. Lord, in your mercy. Beautiful God, out of your abundant blessing, you satisfy us with Christ, the bread of life. Give repentance and faith to all who commune this day, that finding refuge in your Son's true body and blood, we may taste and see that you are good. Lord, in your mercy. Grant us all these things and whatever else you know that we need. Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated and invite the acolytes and the ushers forward at this time for the offering. On the 4th of July, we celebrate the freedom that we have to worship our God, who sent his Son to die for the sins of the whole world, that all who believe may have eternal life. Twice a month, the residents of Battle Creek's Community Pride Care Center join Mr. Whitney for a time of music and singing. During these times, the residents join in singing some of their favorite songs and hymns, even the ones that they learned in Sunday school. This past week, the residents of CPCC were able to join Mr. Whitney and sing praise to our God, who has set us free from our sin at the second annual Patriotic Song Fest. We celebrate all opportunities when God's people gather together and are especially grateful for the opportunity to continue to connect our nursing home residents in the heart of Jesus. <laughs> Congregation will please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Try to give him thanks and praise. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and went in given thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it and given thanks, he said, Take and drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you eat it and drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Congregation may be seated.
please rise. Now may this true body and blood bless and preserve you and keep you steadfast in the one true faith as it sets you free from your freedom, from your slavery to sin and sets you free in Christ. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and look upon you with favor and give you his everlasting peace. Amen.
may be seated for a few brief announcements. First slide, please, ladies. Nomination form for the senior pastor uh, call can be found on the table out there in the narthex. Deadline is next Sunday, but it's July 14th. So make sure you get those nominations in. Next slide, please, ladies. Vacation Bible School donations needs list. A list of donations needed for food and supplies is in the parish hall entryway or go to the church website to view and to sign up. Your generous help is greatly, greatly appreciated. And finally, last slide, please. Council meeting. Following worship this morning in the fellowship in the parish hall, and I'm told there's an abundance of treats, so on your way over to the school conference room, make sure you get some treats and you thank the members who that you saw sworn in this morning and those who have already completed their service. Um, so and with that, we invite you to spend a few moments in silent prayer asking God to help you live more boldly in your freedom of his grace and the forgiveness of your sin that you are no longer a slave to. Amen. <laughs> 